Gee, great to see you again. Well, nice having you, uh, Pat. And uh, Guy, I see we're uh, joined by the Chief Scientific Officer, Luc Duchesne. Luc, welcome. Good morning. Uh, Guy, the last time we talked, back in June, you were fairly new to the job. You took over the job as CEO back in January, and in June we were talking about a rights offering. And it's become clear to me that it's a lot more than a rights offering now. You've got a bifurcated strategy as far as I can see, you've got a hard rock mine and you've got end use in 3D applications. So, Luke, I'm going to save you for the 3D applications. And I want you, if we could, to update me on Crater Lake, because that seems to be your hard rock project, right? Yes, absolutely. So what we did this summer, if I want to update all of the uh, listeners, is that we had a uh, diamond drilling campaign that lasted about 75 days. Uh, so we uh, did some geotechnical drilling to properly design the open pit in the pre-feasibility study, determining the best optimal angle of the slopes of the open pit. But that's technical. What's more exciting on the mining side is the fact that we were able to extend for about 250 meters the length of the mineralized zone that we aim to be mining. So going from 300 meters to 600 meters long. So we are currently waiting for the assay results, but visually the geologist confirmed that the mineralized zone that we're aiming to launch is there. So stay tuned for the, the update on the assay results sometime in November of this year. That's gonna be followed by an updated resource estimate. So that's very, very exciting. And the same in the same topic as the mining uh, aspect of the project is, we are currently working on the logistic of, of it. From the PEA to the feasibility, we're completely reassessing the logistic because we want to shorten the distance of transport, be part of the reduction of the GHG in any mining operations or reducing the transport, gonna reduce our impact on the environment. It's gonna obviously reduce the impact on the cost of production. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit because the mining side, what's the timeline on that uh, if your estimates are as good as you hope they will be? Well, the, uh, the pre-feasibility study would come sometime in Q3 of 2025. That will definitively be, uh, allow us to be able to, I would say, confirm strategic partnerships with real numbers or more accurate numbers as far as CAPEX is concerned, OPEX is concerned, then we're gonna be able to sit down seriously with large end users and confirm their interest. At the same time, we're gonna be collecting additional uh, ore from the deposit by additional drilling to get together a 15 ton mine representative bulk sample, which is the main difference between the pre-feasibility and the feasibility itself. Mm. It's all going to be related to finding a large partner to confirm the sales price and the financial model of the feasibility. But more important, that 15 ton piloting of, to confirm the metallurgical flow sheet. So that's going to take about a year, year and a half. So we expect that the feasibility study, obviously the caveat being money being no object or delays, uh, we expect that by the end of 2026, we would have a feasibility study on this project to be able to make a construction decision. So presumably, uh, the logistics would be able to put together uh, pretty easily by 2026. So look, let's get to you, because I want to talk about 3D printing and the patents that you're putting out. Uh, what is the role of Scandium in 3D printing? Well, we're very excited about the, our patent. We, we developed a process for printing scandium aluminum uh, powders uh, from two alloys that we that that we invented we literally invented two alloys of scandium aluminum we mixed some uh, rare elements in them to make the alloys uh, more efficient at at printing and there's some real art behind this when you print something in 3d metals it, the, the quenching, as in the way the metal cools down, has a significant impact on its microstructure. And traditionally, when you try to do this with scanium aluminum alloys, 
it develops the, the metal when it cools down develops micro cracks which are no good essentially it reduces the mechan mechanical properties of the part so we were able to uh, to add something to that powder, and this is part of the patent, so we can't disclose it to, uh, online. We were <laughs> able to add something that eliminates those micro cracks. We're very proud of it. We're also immensely proud in the fact that we found a way to dope a, a standard aluminum powders with some pixie dust. Again, this is the secret of the patent that permits us to. Uh, literally to to eliminate the very long lead time in developing an alloy in a foundry and then atomizing the material. So we want to use a stock solution essentially to to print new material. So it, it reduces in in practice it reduces the development time for testing a new alloy from months to weeks, and this is immensely significant. Now, this is not our first patent. We also have a, a patent that we've filed on uh, for our flow sheets. So we have one uh, on how to process our minerals. We're also writing as a third patent now to also on mineral processing. So we're, we're very strong in developing intellectual properties because, well, this is unique. What we're doing has never been done anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, and what are the potential applications? Where would people use it? 3D printing and... Scandium aluminum. Well, think of all the parts that go into anything that moves. You, you think of cars. You want to lighten your cars. You want to reduce the weight of your cars. You want to think of airplanes. Think of very complex structures that are built through CNC in uh, in cars, airplanes, uh, leisure, uh, automobile, automobiles. Uh, Things that we could make manufacturers' lives immensely easier by producing complex parts that are very expensive to produce. And that's the sweet spot for 3D printing. You, you, you don't want to print everything that is that goes into a car, but you want to print the really complex parts that need new properties. And for example, we know that scandium aluminum alloys have the advantage of uh, uh, heat diffusion. So you can actually create parts that diffuse heat. So in radiators and eliminating excess heat in cars. Solar panels would be a good example too. Solar panels would be excellent. It will not be 3D printing, it will be extrusion. But imagine if you could reduce the heat, the operating temperature of a solar panel, because we know uh, temperature is a terrible thing for a solar panel. Like the hotter it is in the summer, the less energy is produced. So if you have a frame that's made out of scandium aluminum alloy, that reduces the operating temperature because it acts as a radiator, then you produce more energy. So that supports the solar module industry in a significant way. Yeah, I'm going to get back to you because last time, as I say, when we spoke in June, we were talking about a rights offering. Since that time, you've had uh, private placements, several of them. And, and one, for instance, was supposed to be 100000 and expanded to a million dollars. You're getting a lot of investor interest. Where's that interest coming from? Well, mainly from the uh, the actual uh, retail investors that funded the company privately for the past three four years, so they're increasing their their position or at least not being diluted by the additional financing. So uh, we we have not yet uh, plugged ourselves to uh, large institutions. That's the the next step in our development. That's why I'm going around the world for the next three weeks, starting next week. Uh, finishing by our mark uh, 2024 in Sydney at the end of October. So uh, we're on the road preaching about the company and its uh, benefits. So, uh, but currently mostly Canadian investors, may mostly from Quebec. Okay, so then with this bifurcated uh, strategy, and Luke, you may want to weigh in on this as well. Uh, where does the money start coming in? I mean, it's going to take money to invest in a mine. It's going to take money to uh, have these 3D uh, applications implemented, if you will. Uh, which will be the first one to hit the, the tape? Oh, hit the tape, the first one. It's the easiest one. It's the, the 3D printing. Uh, we're in the pre-commercialization phase, as we call it which is demonstrating to actual large end users, even small end users that can benefit from uh, availability of these powders uh, so that they can themselves check parts that we're going to be printing for them according to their drawings. So we have a 24-month schedule 
to uh, start commercialization of uh, of our powders. Uh, obviously, the, the the industrials that we're talking with are potential large clients uh, in a very short term. So the idea is separately from the mining operation, developing that specific business of 3D printing powders. So uh, that's, and it's gonna take maybe a couple of million dollars. Let's talk about $2 million for the next 24 months to complete that pre-commercialization testing with these uh, end users. And uh, then we're up the road. Luke, any final thoughts? I think it's very exciting. I mean, imagine we are developing our market as well as developing the mines. We're going to be generating revenues for our shareholders ahead of the mine. So this is unknown in mining. We, we're doing something very unique. We are writing a new book here. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to talking to you in the future of how fast that book is being written. Guy, Luke, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Pat. Very pleased, uh, Pat. Thank you very much.